Tyrone. You should be able to see the screen now. Thank you. All right, everyone, it's nine o'clock, so we're gonna get started. Um, so if you wanna get on your computers and get going with this virtual training right now. Um, good morning, my name is Alyssa Ambacher, and we are doing the updates to the case inventory document and instructions training today. Um, I am on the Site Remediation and Waste Management Program Training Committee, and I work in the Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting at the department, and I will be co-moderating today's training with Lynn Mitchell. Good morning, I'm Lynn Mitchell. I am the Assistant Director of the Remediation Review Element, and I am the Manager of the Training Committee, and I am co-moderating today with Alyssa, so welcome. Next slide, please. Just going over a few uh, basic uh, pieces of information to start off with. This training has already been approved for uh, two and a half regulatory credits. Um, you must be logged in for the entire session and answer three out of the four test questions. Next slide, please. Um, since the board has already approved the CECs, this makes everything much easier. Um, we compile a list of the participants, we give that to the LSRPA, um, and then you contact them and they will issue the certificates with a um, $25 processing fee. Same as always, nothing new here. Next slide, please. Um, so since the board has already approved it, this process is, as I said, much quicker now, and you should be receiving your certificates within the next couple of weeks. Next slide, please. Throughout the presentation, there will be some tester knowledge slides. Uh, the green slide on the screen right now is an example of what the quiz questions will look like today. Uh, we will read the question and the possible answers out loud and give everyone a few seconds to answer. Um, so you can see on the screen right now, SID is the acronym for what? And the options are A, cool information dude, B, case itemization details, or C, case inventory document. Next slide, please. And you can see that C is the answer, case inventory document. Uh, please remember that you must answer three out of the four test questions today to receive credit. Next slide, please. There will be time to ask questions throughout the program and the ability to ask questions is open now. Uh, we will cover as many questions as we can in the time that we have, um, but if we can't get to any questions, we will address them via email. Uh, next slide, please. So remember to please fill out the course evaluation here. Um, we have lots of good questions answered there. We appreciate your feedback. We use it um, to help our next presentations. Next slide, please. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Fisher from the LSRPA. Good morning, everybody. As Lynn mentioned, I'm Mark Fisher with the ELM Group. I'm here uh, on behalf of the LSRPA. I'd like to welcome everybody to this morning's training. Uh, the LSRPA takes great pride in our cooperative relationship with the DEP. Uh, we work on a whole host of things with regard to hot topics, guidance, document development, uh, in partnering and training sessions like this one. Even despite the challenges of the pandemic we've been dealing with over the past year or so, uh, we've been able to continue to maintain the momentum we have uh, on a lot of activities invo involving the DEP and the LSRPA. So we really appreciate the department's efforts and everybody's efforts on uh, the LSRPA's end with regard to maintaining the, the momentum with those activities. Next slide, please. So with the LSRPA, we do uh, a, a bunch of events throughout the year. Uh, we have uh, member breakfasts, which we do once a month. We've continued to do that virtually. Uh, they're very interactive, and each of those uh, sessions have a hot topic. So uh, you can log on to the LSRP website and join those member breakfasts. You do get CECs for those as well. No food uh, virtually, unfortunately, but hopefully we'll be back together soon uh, at our favorite diners throughout New Jersey. Uh, we also have steering committee meetings 
uh, that are open to all members. We've been doing those virtually as well. Uh, there's actually one this afternoon if you're interested. Uh, and those committee meetings uh, go through a whole host of all the subcommittees through the LSRPA and you get a lot of good information. And, and again, those are very interactive. We also have uh, an annual golf event. Uh, we partner with SWEP. Uh, it's a fundraiser. We usually do that every fall. And that benefits um, scholarships to students that are pursuing degrees in environmental fields. So uh, it's a great event uh, and, and for a good cause. Uh, I have a couple of courses listed here that are upcoming. Oh, there's a CID training that's coming. I guess that's today. Um, next slide, please. Uh, you can just scroll through these quickly. Um, I just wanted to recognize that the association is sponsored by membership uh, through uh, associate, uh, association partners, and uh, those are the folks who help fund a lot of the work that the association does, so we take great pride in all those sponsors. Um, I also want to recognize uh, the folks we just had an, an, an annual conference uh, that was virtual, and that went off very well. I want to uh, acknowledge both uh, the folks in the LSRPA that put that conference on. It was a great event. And I also want to thank the department. There was uh, several good departmental uh, presentations that happened during the annual conference, and that, that went over really well. So I just wanted to, to express our thanks through the association to the department for those. That's all I have. Enjoy, your com uh, enjoy the training session this morning, and I'll turn it over to the next presenters. All right, thank you, Mark. Uh, we're gonna jump into today's training and we're gonna start with the background for the SIT update. Uh, Mike Custiniano is here from the Bureau of Field Operations and Karen Barnes is here. She's an LSRP with Langen and they're going to discuss the background. So you both can uh, take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Custiniano from the Bureau of Field Operations Southern Field Office. And joining me is Karen from Langen. Uh, next slide. So quickly, I want to recognize uh, the committee members. Uh, these are the folks who worked uh, for the last 18 months to bring this uh, presentation together and uh, to, uh, to to input on the new SID. Next slide. So just by way of a little background, um, so where we started was uh, in the SHRAG meeting in June 2019, um, an issue came up uh, and a decision was made right at the meeting to establish a stakeholder committee. Um, we then met uh, and basically to stab, to ensure that the DEP and the LSRP community have a common understanding of the SID, of the expectations, the purpose. And during the process, we also tried to address, you know, the needs of DEP and the needs and the wants of the LSRP uh, community as well. Uh, Karen? Uh, Mike, as um, Mark alluded to earlier, the LSRPA really appreciates the opportunity to um, participate in these stakeholder meetings. And similar to so many other ones that we're involved with, there's a lot of aha moments there. You know, when we're sitting side by side with the DEP and reviewing some of these questions and some of the entries into the SID form, we find that what the DEP was asking wasn't eliciting the responses that they expected from the LSRPs. So it was a great opportunity to sit and say, well, this is what we think of when you ask that question. And the DEP would say, well, this is what we were trying to actually, information we were trying to actually get. So it, it's a great way to share those perspectives and actually end up with the information that the department's really looking for. So uh, again, thanks for that opportunity. And we always appreciate the stakeholder, uh, being able to provide stakeholder input. Thank you. Um, next slide. Okay, we need the next slide. Here we go, and, and one more. 
Okay, so in uh, back one side, please. There we go. All right, so in today's presentation, what we're going to be doing is uh, basically we're going to pre be presenting the new SID. It's been out for a few weeks, so um, so many of you have seen it already, I'm sure. Um, we're going to go through the new instructions. We're going to go through some of the technical details. And uh, at the later part of the presentation, we'll be actually having some uh, situational case presentations. So you see here, we'll go through an ISRA situation, a remediation progress waiver, multimedia offsite source and um, entertainment situation and how to address those in the SID. Uh, next slide. So um, in terms of what's new, I'm just going to touch on these very, very briefly, but this just kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor of, of what's to come. Um, we've got, uh, you know, fantastic presenters who will go through a lot of these in detail, but here you'll see we've got a um, complete overhaul of the instructions. Um, we've added features to uh, the SID, uh, some of those being an exclude, uh, they see excluded in billing column, which I, I know gets, uh, will get a lot of attention. Um, some functionality features, some data validations that were added. Um, activity number, which actually identifies the case in the system, in our uh, database system. Uh, next slide. Um, some technical things here. Uh, some they validate for upload. Uh, Scott will get into a bit more of this, but um, uh, we built in a, a bit more validations to uh, to to steer uh, the user. Uh, this is a good SID um, and uh, and a uh, data converter where you can actually take your uh, old uh, CID or, or SID case inventory document, uh, email it in and get an upgrade to the new version uh, that's automated. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so with that, uh, I'll let you take it away, Wilson. All right, thank you, Mike and Karen. Um, up next, we have Scott Tyrell from the Bureau of Information Systems, and he is going to be discussing uh, changes to the SID. So, Scott, whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks, everyone. Um, I have quite a few slides, um, so we're just going to kind of race through these and see if anyone has any questions. Um, so I'm Scott Tyrell, I'm Bureau of Information Systems, and uh, you know we are responsible for uh, the upload portion um, where you go and upload the SID itself. And um, I was on the committee, you know, as well, um, trying to incorporate many of the changes um, that were requested. So um, updated SID is version 1.5. As, you, as many of you know, there were some issues and it's now 1.5.1. .1. Um, we had an issue with one of the status codes in there. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, the new version has been developed in conjunction with the LSRPs on the SID committee to try to con address the concerns of the LSRP community in the department. Um, in addition to the new SID version, as Mike mentioned, the new uh, SID uploader um, was improved to allow faster uploads of the SID containing more AOCs. Um, we tried to memorialize all changes in the SID change log available on the forms page. Um, that's a separate PDF. Um, a lot of times that you go to the change log and it's just a web page, but um, you know there were so many changes that we actually put a PDF out there so you can see the changes. So next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted to give a shout out to um, the SID and the SID Conversion Project Manager and the Chief Programmer was Joe Aiello. 
Um, there's thousands of lines of code in the SID itself um, doing the validations and also in that uh, conversion programmer where you where you email your 1.3, 1.4, or a locked 1.5 version and send it in uh, to the email and then it'll send you back the converted version. So there's a, a tremendous amount of work you know, in there. Um, and he was assisted by um, Corey Dews. Next slide, please. I wanted to uh, thank our um, dedicated testers, Tyrone Jordan, um, Prasad Rowe. Um, they did a lot of the upload testing as well as the SID testing itself. And then we had um, SID testers internally and LSRPs, Karen Barnes, um, Grace Allen Hollendonner, Casey Hart, Race Wrestler, and Sylvia Pierce um, did very dedicated testing and provided a lot of comments to us. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to run through um, the changes quickly. Um, we added activity number field in the header, which identifies the case that the SID is um, going into, uh, going to be uploaded to. Um, we added the validate for upload and enable for editing buttons to validate the contents of the SID before you try to upload it. Um, we, added, we added an exclude from billing column. We removed the second additional RA column and we um, added a filter um, drop down for the column so that you can, um, you know, pick, uh, show only the rows for uh, unregulated underground storage tanks, you know, for example, if you needed to see them as, as a group um, while you're editing it. Next slide, please. And uh, Diane will go over the exclude from billing later. So um, we changed some of the column names to uh, more accurately reflect what our expectations are of what should go in there. Um, the AOC status was changed to AOC status achieved. Status date was changed to status achieved date. Incident number was changed to incident communication center numbers managed in case. And the DP AOC number was changed to NJT DP ID. And the reason for that was it's the same as what's in the online service and in all of the um, confirmation email documents that you would get. Um, Christina and Brandy will discuss um, incidents later. Next slide, please. So here we see the new SID and on the left, the activity number in the middle, the two new buttons. Um, in the middle lower, there's the filter button on AOC description. Um, and then above that, an important, um, it says the SID must be finalized. So remember that you have to validate for upload and then finalize it and save it before uploading. And then finally, we have the exclude AOC from billing column next to confirm contamination. Next slide, please. So this is the SID updated items. We have the name changes, AOC status achieved, status achieved date, incident communication center numbers managed in case, NJDP ID. And then finally on the right, we have the second additional RA type column has been removed. Next slide, please. Okay, the changes to the drop downs. Um, there's a lot here. Again, um, we tried to memorialize them in the SID change log on the SRP forms page. No sampling trigger was moved from AOC status to confirm contamination. Um, all of the REO scope of remediation and remedial action types were added to um, AOC status achieved, such as REO is release hold, um, unrestricted use. And that one in particular, the is release hold was um, you know, requested by LSRPs on the committee. So we added all of them. Um, then we have um, sediment, surface water, and indoor air were added to contaminated media, and we removed none. Um, if there has been no contamination above standards, then you would just leave it blank. So you don't have to fill everything in if, if there's no need to. Um, not applicable was removed from contaminants of concern. The same idea, if contamination wasn't detected above standards at that AOC, you just leave it blank. 
and not applicable was added to order of magnitude. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, in applicable remediation standard, um, the soil cleanup criteria must have a raw approved for AOC prior to 12-2-2008, uh, was changed to soil cleanup, cleanup criteria C instructions. And we're actually gonna release a new version of the instructions, um, hopefully later today, which clarifies that. We added attainment to RA type and um, physical or hydraulic containment was shortened. We changed no remedial action to remedial action not required in the RA type column. Next slide, please. So we have some SID usability changes. Um, again, the filter column values, if you have a lot of AOCs that are of the same type, you can highlight the cell and, and copy. Uh, or, or you can also control C and then paste or control V into the next AOC type cell You know, with that type. The hidden code columns have been removed. Um, copy, paste, copy down and clear can be used. Cut and delete is still disabled. The reason it's disabled is we have to maintain um, our internal row numbers um, or the uploader won't work properly. Um, spell check had to be disabled, um, is disabled actually by Excel due to the internal checking. Um, value from dropdown can be copied and pasted. And validations, when you validate the cells with the errors, are identified and are highlighted um, in a reddish color. Next slide, please. Uh, before I just beware, copy down works, which is um, some of you may be familiar with, but beware that if you copy down a date or a number that Excel will see that as a series and it will give you the next date, the next day or the next number you know, in a series. I've seen that a number of times in SIDS that have been submitted and um, you know, it creates bad data. So just watch it. So you can convert the SID to the new version. Um, SIDs ver and versions older than 1.5.1 or the latest must be converted before the SID can be uploaded. Uh, 1.3, 1.4 or locked 1.5 may be converted by emailing to the SID email box, SRP SID conversion at dep.nj.gov and the converted SID will be emailed back. This is an automated process. There's no one monitoring that. and um, if you keep sending stuff to that box, uh, you know there's a chance that um, it'll be seen as spam, you know, by our system. So please don't email that box with anything but a SID attached. Um, if, if values in the SID are no longer options, as we mentioned, what's changed in the dropdowns, the cells will be returned as a blank. So of course, always review the converted SID carefully and obviously make any changes you know, that you need before you try to validate and upload it. Um, so one thing I wanna mention here is that right now, the SID converter tries to convert every attachment that is attached. So if you had two SIDs attached, it would try to send you an email back for each of those um, SIDs that were attached. However, if you have embedded pictures in your email like your company logo that is an attachment and the SID will try to convert that as well it's not it's it's not you know it just goes and tries to convert everything so you'll get an email back and it'll say it's the wrong format but you also get an email back with your SID attached so you know don't worry about the ones that are wrong format as long as you got back what you were expecting in one of the emails I think um, Someone mentioned to us that they got six emails back because they had six embedded pictures in their email. Okay, next slide, please. So because the SID has macros that are doing the checking. Stop doing cardio. This is how it's backwards, right? Well, believe it or not, it's actually true. Because the SID has macros that are doing the checking of the SID, you may get a yellow banner. Click enable editing um, if you get the SID from the converter or enable content or both. This allows the checking code to run. And you may also see it ask to make a trusted document. If it does, click yes. 
um, populate the SID or edit the SID and save, it does auto save. So you may get a message to replace it where you haven't remembered that you saved and that's okay. Next slide, please. So next we have the validate for upload process. I'm gonna go through what happens when you click validate for upload. So, so there's a two path process here. One just allows you to check it and the other allows you to lock it for upload. So we're gonna go through both processes. So you click the validate for upload and then you follow the prompts. And uh, next slide, please. So this comes up, it asks you whether you want to check the report for errors or finalize it. So you would click yes to finalize it or no to check for the errors. So we're gonna click no. Next slide, please. So it's this is the what it's validating. It's checking for in the header, the case name, PI number, activity number are required. It checks for AOC ID, AOC type, AOC description, confirmed contamination, AOC status achieved, status achieved date and activity are all required for every AOC. Um, and then it's checking the incident communication center number to make sure it's a valid format. Um, and also that the status achieved date is a valid format in month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. AOC ID, AOC description, and activity fields are validated for the length. They are 100, 500, and 4,000 characters with spaces, respectively. Um, and also, AOC ID column A must be unique, such as AOC 1, AOC 2, AOC 3, um, AOC groundwater, et cetera. Next slide, please. So the conditionally required fields, if confirmed contamination equals yes, then we expect to see contaminated media, contaminants of concern, applicable remediation standard, exposure route, order of magnitude. And if the status achieved um, is set to RA, then we, need a, we would like to see an RA type um, in the RA type. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so we checked this. So if you had um, anything that the checker found, it would pop up a little message and you may have to allow pop-ups too. Um, it says warning the AOC type may be incorrect based on the description um, is one of the warnings that we have. So um, it's looking at your text of your description for information about underground storage tanks because it's critical that the underground storage tanks have the correct AOC type or the service will not work properly after the upload. This one also shows that the status date is required. So it looks like in our SID when we populated it, we forgot one of the status dates. So we're gonna click okay. Next slide, please. So because when we click OK, it takes us back to our SID and we can see the status date over on the right hand side is highlighted. So that's a big help. You can scroll around your SID and everything that has been identified so far will be highlighted. Um, we don't think that it can highlight everything if there are hundreds of errors. Um, I hope you don't have hundreds of errors, but you can clear up the errors that are highlighted and then run that again and it'll highlight the next set of errors. But if you have you know, a few errors such as 10, you know, it'll highlight everything and you can click and take care of it. Next slide, please. So we're gonna go ahead, we fixed our error. So we're gonna go ahead and now click yes. We're gonna click validate and upload, uh, validate for upload, and then we're gonna click yes, that we wanna finalize the report now. It's gonna do another error check just to be sure. Next slide, please. So we're gonna click yes here and finalize the report. It says there appear to be no errors. The report will now lock and prepare for submission. Yep, go ahead, yep. So that'll go ahead and lock it. And now the SID cannot be uploaded in DP online unless it's finalized. 
The cells in the SID are locked after the workbook is finalized. The way you can check is you click in a cell and make sure it's not editable. I like to click in the dropdown cells, and if the dropdown doesn't appear, then it is locked and ready for upload. Make sure to save it. And then after the SID has been uploaded in a remedial phase service, you can click enable for editing again to edit. We have found that because the code runs when you open it, that when you enable the SID, it'll unlock it anyway. So usually it'll be unlocked when you open it. So um, don't open it again right before you upload it because you'll just need to go back and finalize it, which is really three clicks. So you know, finalizing it, the one that is, uh, doesn't have any errors in it is click, 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 and it's finalized. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so some of, some people want to print or PDF this it. Again, there's internal programming that um, you know prevents some of the common you know ways to do this. So um, in the print menu, you can choose Microsoft Print to PDF, and then choose Ignore Print Area. Then you can set the pages from one to the number of pages needed to capture. Only the SID AOC tracking sheet because you don't want to print, you know, the instruction page, you know, and the in the other tabs that are in there, uh, the example page, for example. So click print, um, choose where to save the PDF, open the PDF, and print. Uh, another option is you can use the Windows snipping tool to clip an image of the SID um, that produces really good results. Also, next slide, please. So this is what the settings look like. I wanted to have this here so that it's an easy reference for anybody coming back here. And um, we are going to put this in the directions um, when we uh, publish them today or tomorrow, uh, the, the revised version. And that just shows you, um, you know, the print options. And that the first, the, the left-hand side shows the ignore print area. And then the right-hand side is just a summary of the options. There's really not much to do here. It's just ignoring the print area is the key. And that gives you just the SID itself and not the other tabs that are in the SID. Next slide, please. OK, so what we'd be doing next is we will be uploading the SID to DP Online. And the SID can be uploaded in the PA, PASI, um, RI, RA, RAW, and eventually um, we're getting ready the REO service. Um, and um, most of these are for AOCs and also entire site submissions. And um, next slide, please. Any questions? So we are um, going to take a few questions right, right now. Um, Lynn, if you want to. I'm here. It. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start with telling everybody that um, who's on uh, the line now, please mute, mute your microphone. Um, we are hearing somebody's, uh, a couple of people maybe, but their background noises. So we'd appreciate it if you would mute yourself. Um, not sure where it's all coming from. And I see that everybody has been taking full advantage of all of our question slides and you have been asking lots of questions here. So um, I will start with them. Uh, one question was asked, Scott, that um, would it be possible to provide a password to unprotect this document? Um, we can't um, allow that because it would break the programming and the validation inside of it. Um, we will be collecting a list of um, items for we can work on for future changes, um, additional usability issues. Um, you know, we have some some things in mind already, some things we weren't able to accomplish um, in the time that we had to put this version out. Um, one thing to note um, on usability is that. Um, you know, you can take the contents of your set out, put them in another spreadsheet and, and spell check it, for example, and then they can be pasted back in again. There's not as much of an issue with pasting into this um, SID as before. There, There is somewhat of an issue if you paste 
invalid um, contents from the old SID into the new SID. Um, it may lock and you actually, and, but it may not upload. So, um, you know, we're working on that too. But um, unfortunately we can't allow the password to be given out. Um, before I read the next question, I also want to advise everybody that um, we are um, at maximum capacity at this training. So tr don't, if you get booted out, you might not be able to come back in. So be careful. Um, so next question, are you expecting this SID converter to take a few days? Um, the SID converter should return the SID to you um, that day, um, hopefully fairly quickly. Um, if you haven't gotten it back uh, that day, um, please contact the NJDP online support email box. Um, you can attach the SID that you tried to convert so that we know what to look for. Um, we have had a situation where an LSRP appears to have sent three SIDs to the converter and the converter had no record of them. And the LSRP resubmitted them a few days later and they came right back. So we're not quite sure what happened there. So if you haven't gotten it back, you know, by the end of the day, um, just again, send an email to NJDP online support. Okay, um, just a reminder, everybody, please keep yourself on mute. Next question, would a SID upload fail if the document has not been finalized? Yes, yes, it does. It fails and it says it's the wrong version number because um, we don't, um, the version number is not saved into it until the validation is finalized. When emailing the SID to, to the converter, is there a specific subject line or naming convention or anything that you need? No, there isn't. Um, and we take the name of your SID and we append your email address to it. And um, we put the word fixed on the end of it just so that you can make sure that you can tell the SID from the converter from the one that you sent in uh, easily. Um. The applicable remediation standards box must now be completed, but it only includes choices for soil. How do we do um, handle other media like groundwater quality standards? Um, is that that's going to be covered later on, correct? Great. Okay. And it's only we'll required when Marlene. confirmed contamination is yes. We'll get back to Marlene. Hold that question. Um, uh, we asked, we answered the SID question again. Somebody else had the same question. Is there a workaround for the disabled spell check? There isn't right now, and that's going to be worked on for a future release. We're hoping that we can do that. Again, you can take your contents out, um, you know, copy your contents and, and into another workbook and then um, spell check it. We apologize for that. We thought we had, um, there was, there was, it, what, we did have spell check working. Um, but in the final couple of releases and things that we added, it disabled it. Um, there's a, another, there's a question regarding data miner to, um, or a data miner report that will also be covered later. Yes. So I believe Sean so, but just be aware that there is a data miner report that allows you to um, download um, existing SIDs from uh, cases. Um, however, it finds everything that's a SID, so you can only convert um, SIDs that are 1.3, 1.4, or 1.5. So there are 1.1 and 1.0, 1 1.1 SIDs out there, and PDFs that you can't convert. Just be aware of that. Um, can someone please address printing the new SID, saving as a PDF when you have a chance? Yeah, we did that. That's the, the, it's going to be in the new instructions, and it, I went over it a couple of slides ago. Um, can we leave blank rows? You cannot leave blank rows because we are the the uploader um, would stop there. Uh, when printing, does paper size matter? We are not. When you make a PDF, just you know, use the directions for making the PDF that we described. And then you can print it, you know, any way you need to as as the PDF. 
And again, you can also, I, I recommend the snipping tool is, is a great tool to, uh, you know, grab, you uh, open up the SID across your entire screen and then snip it. And then you can save it, uh, you know, into a Word document and then PDF that, and it makes a, a good tool for, you know, sending it to the client. Um, we have a lot of questions and we have a lot more to go here um, in Scott's presentation. So um, I'm going to stop here with Rohan and we will, um, I'll come back to this question unless it was already answered in the next part of Scott's presentation. Okay, is that all right, Scott? It sure is. Yes. <laughs> I wanna make sure we get to everybody's presentation this morning. Okay, next slide. Okay, like I said, we're going to go and we're going to take your finalized SID and we're going to go ahead and upload it in the service. Um, if this is the screen that you'd see after you log into NJDP online, um, you go to your workspace tab and you know you have added services that you want to work on with that configure services button. And if you add LSRP related services, you are ready to go. So you click on LSRP related services. Next slide. Okay, next slide, you, next uh, page you see uh, shows the available LSRP related services. And in the middle there, you would click on remedial phase document submission. Next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna, um, skip some pages in the service to uh, make this a little quicker. So after reading the instructions page, you would click continue to get to the facility selection. The facilities are added in your workspace or you can click the link under the grid, the, the little um, blue link that says click here and search for the facility to add. And so once we have our SRP test industrial site selected, we're gonna click continue. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, since we just picked a facility, it's a good time to discuss terminology. Um, each of the areas regulated as site comes from a different regulatory program with its own IDs. The facilities are also known as program interests or PIs and are plugged into a common site when possible. The site is like a filing cabinet in the department. The program interests are like the drawers in the filing cabinet and the permit and cases are like folders in the drawers and the submissions reports and data are in those folders. So um, next slide, please. So again, going back to our case selection, um, I'm gonna show three cases, which are at one PI. We have an early 2008, a 2008 spill which is in an LSRP case that opted in. Um, between 2009 and 2012, you could choose to go into the LSRP program and that's what they did. So their activity types is LSRP opt-in case. Um, we have an ISBR trigger uh, in 2013, that was a stock transfer. And then last, a um, 2020, is a trigger that's a bankruptcy. So we have three individual cases here. They've been kept separate um, for whatever reason. They could be um, different responsible parties. They could have, um, their timeframes could be such that they couldn't be combined and, and what have you. Next slide, please. So again, um, this is a good time to talk about case terminology. So, um, Case contains a remediation trigger dates with timeframes, a responsible party and a location. Um, different cases allow multiple RPs and triggers timeframes to be tracked at a site. Um, currently LSRP cases are designated with an LSR plus two digit year plus a four digit sequential number such as LSR 12001. That number is only unique when combined with the program interest number. So um, you may have many, many cases that are LSR 12001, but that should always be taken in context with the program interest ID. 
case can be closed when the AOCs in it are addressed by one or more final remediation documents. So we're gonna zoom in closer. Next slide, please. So these are our three cases, and we're gonna show the cases with their corresponding SID. They each have different SIDs, and that's been a, a problem we've been experiencing is that, you know, an LSRP may have a site or a program interest that has several different cases on it, and they put the same SID in to each of the case over and over again, which is confusing because they're not handling all the AOCs under each of the cases. So again, mentioned case LSR 10001 is a 2008 incident, a spill. The RP opted into the LSRP program in 2010. There is one AOC for that spill. Next slide, please. So there's our there's our case. Um, that's our spill case. Next slide, please. Okay, again, so the SID only contains the AOC from the 2008 spill. Next slide, please. And this is what our SID looks like. So there's our one AOC. Description is a chemical spill. Um, and again, this is confirmed contamination. Yes, this is our one AOC for our 2008 spill in our opt-in case. Next slide, please. So as we go through the cases, the next is a, an ISRA trigger in 2013. Uh, this said, um, ISRA is a little bit different than spill and us cases. Um, the ISRA program wants to see, and the ISRA program looks has a look back. It looks at all of the activities prior to the trigger. Um, so that so this SID will contain all the AOCs prior to and including the 2013 ISRA trigger date. Um, therefore, it does not include AOCs that are from after the 2013 trigger date, but it does include the AOC from the 2008 spill. Next slide, please. So here's our imaginary submission, and we are submitting for the ISRA case 2013. We have a new AOC. We had um, one 1,000 gallon gasoline ust on the site, and see from the 2008 case. Next slide, please. So finally, we're down to the bottom. We're at our 2020 ISRA trigger. This is the second ISRA trigger, the bankruptcy. And when we do a submission for this one, it'll have all AOCs prior to the 2020 trigger date. Um, next slide, please. And here's our SID. So we have our AOC from our 2008 spill. We have our AOC from our 2013 ISRA trigger. And we have our new AOC that we found when the PA was done for the 2020 ISRA trigger. So this is the way your SID would be submitted. Um, the, we've, the status achieved date, um, They've gone for a whip, rip waiver for the second, for the, sorry, the first ISRA case. Um, Mike will be talking more about ISRA and rip waivers in the future. Um, I wanna point out in this slide, it's important. So when we load this SID, AOC ID, AOC is, AOC one is AOC-1, AOC two is AOC-3, but our AOC3, we've just put AOC3 without the dash in there, and that's gonna be important as we go on. There's nothing wrong with that, but if it's changed, it causes additional work later. Next slide, please. So here's a summary of the three cases 
uh, the three SIDs for each case, I should say. So in the 2008 incident case, um, which opted into the LCP program in 2010, the SID contains AOCs only from the 2008 incident. Um, and the LSRP can issue an um, AOC REO for for that um, for that incident for that case. And then the ISRA 2013 case, the SID contains all the AOCs below and any prior to 2013 ISRA case. If this case existed on its own, it couldn't be closed before the 20, 20, 2008 incident was closed out. So for that case, because there's a subsequent ISRA case, the department can issue a remediation and progress waiver to close that one. Then for the 2020 ISRA case, again, we have contains all the AOCs from the 2020 ISRA case trigger and before. Um, if the other cases are closed out, the LSRP can issue an ISRA entire site REO for that. This is, if those, these cases get closed out in this chronological order, it would be like the list above. And Michael will go into more detail on ISRA cases again. Next slide, please. So as we continue through our service, we go and do the, uh, we're gonna do a PA uh, for, for our AOCs. So next slide, please. We wanted to point out um, if you have comments that you want the inspector to be aware of, um, you can put them in here. Uh, this is a really good place to say, you know, anything that's happening in the service you might want them to be aware of, or anything in the SID that you want them to be aware of. Um, next slide, please. So again, use the comments box on the submission name page, explanations regarding the SID or the service that don't fit neatly, or any additional information or explanation that you want the department to have. Next slide, please. So going through the service again. So this is what the uh, this is what the uh, inspector actually would be able to see. Um, in the submission comments, and this is your summary also. So this is what you would you would be able to review as well um, after the service was submitted. Next slide, please. Okay, we're going to go continue to go through the service. Um, we're going to skip through additional site information where you would review the location, blocks, and lots, and then contacts where you would enter the person responsible. For for conducting the remediation, and we'll go to the next page. Next, next slide, please. So we're going to go to the SID upload, and the important thing to note is that the NJD PID must be blank for the first SID upload to a case. Um, NJD PIDs are provided in the service summary and in the confirmation email attached after the first SID upload. DPIDs should be added to the SID after the first upload to ensure uh, duplicate AOCs are not created in the future. It helps the service match to what's been uploaded previously. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, so here we are. So we have our first test your knowledge question. So the question is, the poll is now op the poll is open, I believe. And the question is, the column NJP DEP ID must be blank for the first SID upload to a case. Is that true or false? So this is, oh, there we go, poll is now open. So this is something that uh, normally when we, uh, in the past, when we had this live, I would be asking uh, the audience uh, in the room to be answering the question as well, but uh, we don't have that opportunity. So I would like to start by reminding everybody to please um, take the time to fill out the uh, link to the questionnaire that we have for you. Um, it's important that we have your information. We have a question at the bottom of the monkey survey for uh, information on what you would like 
in the remediation standards uh, rule that uh, what train what information you'd like us to provide in training for the upcoming remediation standards. So please make sure that you uh, fill it out so we have that information uh, so we can give you the best training possible. And with that, the poll is about to close. So thank you all. And we will move on to uh, the answer, which is next slide. The answer is true. Okay, so in our service, we've gotten to the SID upload page, as we mentioned. Um, so here is where you click the Choose File button and you find your SID file. Um, the most common error message that we've been having for the new SID is that the SID has not been locked. So if you get an error message, make sure the SID has been locked. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go over there are some additional validations that occur here when you do the upload. They can't be validated uh, in the SID itself because it's connecting to our internal database to make those checks. So we're going to check the SID version, that the SID is finalized. Again, make sure to save. Um, it's also checking the incident communication numbers um, after March 2002 are actually valid and are in our database. And then it's also gonna check that incident numbers um, after November 4th, 2009 are checked to see if a CDN, confirmed discharge notification, was filed or if the incident um, is eligible UHOT. Uh, UHOT can be remediated um, if there are other AOCs uh, at the PI. And then finally, checks for NJDPs if DEP IDs if they're added, you know, are checked to see if they're valid. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, I wanted you to keep an eye on that AOC three. So this is the next page in the service. It's called the SID Upload Confirmation page, and it shows um, the first few columns of what you uploaded. You should always check this carefully, make sure it has exactly what you need. Um, so this first upload is a PA. PAs include all of the AOCs. So the AOCs in submission is grayed out and checked. Um, if this was an AOC submission, such as an SI AOC, you would choose which of the AOCs in your SID are represented in the report that you're uploading. Could be all of them, could be one of them. Um, good thing to note here, it doesn't display in the page, but there's an AOC report link below the grid. So you can click the report link and it'll show you what AOCs have been uploaded previously to that case. It's very useful if you didn't check it earlier. Um, and again, there's a data miner report where you can download the um, any SIDs that were previously uploaded or even sent to the department. That was a request of the committee, you know, early on, and we wanted to make sure that we did that. Next slide, please. So. Um, here on this page, validations will check for uh, AOCs in the case that are not reconciled. So it checks your SID and then sees if there are AOCs that you're leaving behind. It'll give you a warning message or in entire site services, a red message saying that there are SIDs that were uploaded previously, but you don't have them in your SID. Um, it also checks um, and gives a warning message if there are incident communication center numbers um, that it doesn't find in the case um, is a discrepancy. Next slide, please. So going through our service again, um, once we've uploaded the SID, um, we're gonna answer the questions, we're gonna do our attachment uploads, we're gonna 
do a receptor evaluation, CEA attachments if necessary. Um, we're going to upload the report and then we're going to certify the service. So we skipped all those to make this a little bit faster. Next slide, please. So um, let's say you did that PA and then a year later, you're doing another submission. You open the SID to, you know, check it to advance the status and the status dates for different AOCs. And you notice that your AOC3 didn't have a dash in it. It was inconsistent with the other ones. And you don't like that. So it didn't look good to you. So you put a dash in AOC3. This is what would happen because of that. So the staffer noticed the dash was missing. Um, they put it in there. And let's load the revised SID to an RI. That'll be our next service that we're going to load in this case. Um, Next slide, please. So we've loaded the SID and then we go to the SID confirmation upload page. For AOCs one and two, nothing was changed um, except the status and the status date and the activity, for example. Um, maybe confirm contamination now. So the system tries to go in and it finds AOC1 in the case, it finds AOC2 in the case with the same descriptions. And then AOC3, it's different, it's only different by a dash, but it couldn't find it. So it thinks it's a new AOC because it couldn't find it. It doesn't say system found match. Next slide, please. So you don't want that to be a new AOC. So you would go in and you would click that arrow, uh, that drop down arrow, um, change the new AOC to no. Next slide, please. That allows you to click the drop down in the associate with existing AOCs. And then that will show you all the AOCs that are actually in the case. And then that's where you'll find your AOC three that doesn't have the dash in it. And you can link that AOC from the case to your AOC3. And what will happen on submission is that the new AOC-3 will update the case. So you'll get what you want by choosing this, and it will overwrite the AOC in the case. This prevents um, duplicates in the case. Um, and again, the duplicates are bad because it makes it look like there are extra AOCs. Um, again, notice the AOC and submission. If you were doing an AOC only service, you would choose the AOCs from the SID that are covered in the report being submitted. Next slide, please. Okay, in this service, we added um, a state or federally regulated underground storage tank. So now we go to the next page after the SID confirmation upload page and we see the AOC tank relationship page. This has a drop down and it shows the um, UST AOCs that are in your SID. And, and this is a simple one with um, one underground storage tank. And you simply pick your AOC um, to relate it to the underground storage tank. So the, the way this page works is if I had 10 underground storage tanks here, I could add them all into one AOC by repeatedly picking that same AOC on the left-hand side. Only associate the USTs to the AOCs that are in the service and the document. So if you're doing an, an AOC only um, submission, you don't have to associate all of the USTs um, you know, in that service. Next slide, please. So again, we're going to complete our RI service. We're going to answer our questions. We're going to do our attachment uploads. We're going to do our main report upload. And then we're going to certify the service. Next slide, please. So we're going to show you the, so the certification page does additional validations. Um, it identifies AOCs in the SID that are duplicates of the case AOCs. This could be resulting from, you know, where you've started, um, say an SI and an, and an RI, if you're doing a quick remediation. Um, 
you need to uh, completely submit that first submission before starting the second submission, or you'll get an error message here. It's not the end of the world. You can go back and reload the SID and not lose any data, but it's it's just time consuming. It takes a couple of minutes to get through back to the end of the service again. So the submission summary will then display if it found no errors. So you'll successfully certify. Next slide, please. So this is um, looking at our um, submission summary or service summary. And um, the DPOC, DPAOC uh, numbers are assigned by the service. Um, they can be found in the submission summary and the attachment to the service confirmation email. Next slide, please. So that's what they look like in the service summary. Next slide, please. This is it blown up a little bit, just so you can see what where the IDs are. And uh, they, they can be, um, you know, copied and pasted, you know, from there, but they also are emailed to you. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to show you what the us looks like in the summary, you know, very similar to the to the uh, page I showed you. It shows the AOC on the left, and it would show the AOC multiple times if there were multiple us included in that AOC. Next slide, please. So next we get our confirmation email, and the confirmation email would include a list of all the AOCs uploaded in any service to the case that shows all the AOCs out of the case. So if you were an LSRP and you were responsible for only one AOC and you submitted um, just for that one AOC, the confirmation email will include everything that was in the case and your um, the AOC that was in your submission will be checked off. Um, it'll show duplicates created if mistakes were made, so review it carefully. And then again, contact NJTP online support at dp.nj.gov if there are problems with AOCs in the case. Sorry, next slide. Again, that's the address to send. Yep, and then here's what our uh, next slide. Here's um, our confirmation email. We also give the NJDP IDs in that. Um, that's convenient because um, that's a PDF, so you can copy those out and then add them, you know, back to your SID if necessary. Apologize, we got these. Um, I'm running a little ahead because I'm using a separate presentation. Next slide, please. Okay. So as we mentioned before, um, SID versions 1.3, 1.4, and locked 1.5 may be converted by emailing the SID to SRP SID conversion at dep.nj.gov. Um, don't talk to that box. Um, don't send it anything but SIDs to be converted. Um, if you do have questions, um, you can contact NJDP online support at dep.nj.gov again. If there are problems, it would, it, it's helpful to attach your SID if you're having you know, issues with it. Um, so that we can start to work on it right away. Again, don't send duplicate emails. Don't send emails with no SID attached. Don't reply to the converter. Um, and just contact NJDP online support if you have any issues. Next slide, please. Questions, any questions? Oh, we have so many questions for you, Scott. <laughs> so many questions. Um, okay, so we're going to take questions for the next um, 10 or 15 minutes, and then we will break after this. Um, we, uh, just so everybody knows that once this presentation is done, within a couple of days, um, this will be made available on the uh, training webpage. So, to Rohan's question, just to convert, just to confirm, we validate and save, and then when we are ready to upload to the online service, then we enable editing again before uploading? No, you leave it locked and then upload it. And then the next time you need to use it, then 
if it's still locked, it shouldn't be because when you open it again, it probably will unlock. But if it's still locked, then you would click enable editing. Okay. Um, can you print the SID for review before upload to DEP? Yeah, we just we uh, went over the printing uh, before, you know, in the slides before, okay. and we'll we'll add those to the instructions. Does the conversion email require a specific subject line? You said no. No, you can. It, I mean, I think you should put something in the subject line. Okay, but it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, what if there's a situation where there is no communication center number? Leave it blank. So the old SID that will still be used for a new phase, have that uploaded for conversion, is that correct? Or just sure. upload and convert when we're sending in a new phase SID? When should they send it in, basically, is their question. Right. Um, the SID upload page will have the current version. So on it in the directional text and the text on the page. So if you have the current version, uh, which is in the upper left-hand corner, then you can just keep using that. Um, if you find that you have an old version, then you would send it in to the converter. Will the SID work with Excel for Mac or only in Windows? Um, we, we've only used it in uh, in Windows. Um, we just haven't tested it in, in, in Mac. We don't have access to Mac easily. So I can't answer your question. Um, you, could, you could give it a try. Okay, we have to stop the virus scan in order to allow the macros to work. Any, whoops, I can't read the rest of this question. Any suggestions how to handle that? Yeah, we have been informed of that. I mean, it, it may ask you um, to make it a trusted document, um, but we'll definitely look into that and, and try to get back to you. Um, um, if you're at the REO phase and include the SID with the REO, um, submittal the email, do you need to update to the new SID format? Not at this time, but you should get used to using the new format. I mean, if you validate it before REO, then you'll know that um, BIR has what they're looking for. Inspection review will have what they're looking for. Um, I got the following error when I opened the new SID file, Excel found unreadable content in SID worksheet. Um, just send that to um, NJTP online support um, email and um, we'll work with you on that. Is the status to achieve date always the date the document demonstrating compliance was submitted? We're going to go over that. Yeah, we're going over later. That. Um, is there any way to insert a row in the SID to say if a new AOC is added? Um, to I don't avoid believe so. Um, again, you can you can copy and paste. Um, so you can move things around by, you know, copying and pasting. But we really don't want you to renumber everything. So we're not right. really wanting to enter right. new AOCs. Um, is, there an, is there an effective date for the new version which the middles need to be, um, oops, need to be converted by? Just do it all now? I mean, you have to upload to the the new version, so um, I'm not exactly sure what what that means. But you know, when you go to upload, you have to have the new version, and if you don't have the new version, then you know, send it to the converter and then check it, you know, before you upload it. Um, you can do it. Take all your SIDs and convert them now, you know, if you want, um, or or you can or you can wait. Uh, it's up to you. Um, somebody asked the question, who in the department uses the SID and how? And I believe the answer is basically the site remediation program uses it. I don't believe anybody else in the department uses it. And, and you know, we'll have um, inspectors um, speaking later, so they can speak to that as well. Yes. Um, every, SID is, what, every SID is inspected. Every single SID is looked at. Correct. 
Um, what if our incident communication center number is incomplete, like we don't have the last two digits? Um, the last two digits were um, started in the 90s, I think, uh, with the yep. seconds. And um, so again, you, you can, you know, contact NJDP online support, you know, if if you have a, an incident, we have a database of old incidents and, um, you know, we can find the, the, the new ones as well. And data miner is really good for everything after March, 2002, you know, for searching for, for incidents also. Okay. Um, the notes field is strictly character limited for AOCs with long history. We'll be going into that um, what you need to put in the note field, I believe, later on. Right. In uh, with Diane and Christina's presentation, um, what happens if you have more than two RA types? Um, yeah, we would want you to put that in the um, activity, and um, and also for conversion, um, if you have it in the third RA type, it's it's going to add it to the beginning of your activity. And then obviously you can edit it at that point. Um, we just didn't want to make, we do, We found it wasn't used very much. Yes, I know people have used it, um, but we just didn't want to make this, you know, even longer um, because we felt like we had to add the exclude from billing, but we didn't want to make the, the sit even longer. What you enter for the DEP AOC ID if none is available? Leave it blank. Mm -hmm. um, why use the converter versus just filling out the new version? You can fill out the new version if you want. It's available on the um, SRP forms page. Certain old case numbers do not follow the standard format. We've just discussed that. Some have a letter C after it. Um, yeah, the, the internal validation um, covers all of the formats that we know of. So if you put that C in there and it's, you know, it, it should be accepted. Um, if it's not, um, you know, contact us. Um, we may be able to get you the full, you know, incident number if it's not accepted. Um, but it's a very, it's a very complicated validation that covers uh, numerous possible um, standards that were used for for incidents through the years. And those uh, possible standards were covered in a listserv a couple of years ago. Um, so, you know, we can we can send that out to you or you can search for it on the listserv archives on the SRP website as well. There are many cases, and uh, this will probably be our last question, and I know there's lots of others, but we will have that for you um, later uh, if we need time. But the last question right now is there are many cases where the same PI, um, same LSR has more than one LSRP assigned to it. Do the SID uploads mesh? Right, so um, the LSRP committee was, was really good about that and um, that was an ex extensively covered and Really, you we're we're okay if you just submit a SID for the AOCs that you are retained for. Obviously, you can't submit an entire site um, service, you know, that way. But if you um, you know are doing an SI AOC, you know, for one UST, you can just include the AOC for that UST if you want. Okay, and. Um, as a reminder, you had wanted to mention that if they have problems, with they would, you prefer them to ask them beforehand, correct? Good, good point, Lynn. Um, people have often said, I saw something funny or I didn't agree with or I didn't know what it meant in the service, but I went and certified anyway. And then sometimes it's an enormous cleanup afterwards where someone had submitted even entirely to the wrong case or even to the wrong PI, um, it, can, it can happen. So, you know, if you see something that 
you don't like um, or you don't understand, please contact us first. Um, we, we've been really um, happy with uh, contacts that we've had this week. Um, we've tried to respond to everyone within the day or, or a couple of days, so we're trying to get to these quickly. Um, some of them are very complicated, you know, where, where there were sites, entire sites that were merged together and can create a complicated case scenario, you know, within that, that new PI. And we're still dealing with some of those issues, but please contact us before certifying so that we can try to address any issues that you might have. Okay, so we are, thank you, Scott, very much. Um, we're going to take a five, four minute break now. We will be back at 1025. Um, everybody, uh, I have your questions and as stated earlier, if we don't get a chance to, to answer your questions during the presentation, we will try to get back to them later. Thank you, we'll be back soon. Hi, so welcome back. 
from the break. I understand it was a short one, so I hope people are back now. Um, before we start with Christina and Diane, Tyrone, are you here? I am here. Okay, can you please answer people's question on the polling? Hello, everyone. Um, um, good morning. Um, when the poll, when we open the polls, there there will be a designated pop-up box where the polls will display. Please answer the questions in the poll section. The poll section will remain open for a minute. Um, please answer there because the platform provides a report and a tally for us, and that way we can have that information in a report. So please uh, refrain from answering the poll questions in the questions box. So if you'll do that, um, it'll be greatly appreciated. Um, thank you, and uh, we look forward to um, <laughs> helping you if you have any additional questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tyrone, for helping me explain that. And now um, I would like to uh, say next slide and move our presentation over to the instructions uh, with Diane Gard and Christina Page. Take it away. You're muted. Still can't hear you. Just one moment, I'm checking on them. <laughs> Sorry for the technical Chris difficulties, folks. Okay. I am unmuted. Good okay, morning. Yay. Um, as uh, Lynn mentioned, Tyrone, do you have something to say? Yeah. Yes. Um, and who else needs to be unmuted? Diane Gard. Diane. Okay. I'll just thank you. Thanks, Tyrone. All right. So, good morning, everyone. I'm Christina Page, uh, as Lynn mentioned. I hope everyone is warm and safe and dry. Um, I am um, currently working in the Division of Remediation Management in the Site Remediation Program, but spent many years working in the Bureau of Inspection and Review and uh, have done a lot of work on the SID, not only just working um, with stakeholders on this presentation and the updates to the SID, but uh, for years doing trainings, fielding calls, and um, we really hope that today is beneficial to everyone. So, Diane, would you like to add to that? Hi, I'm Diane Gard. I am a supervisor in the Bureau of Inspection and Review. I've been at the department for 15 years in BIR since the very beginning when Sarah was passed. Uh, before that, I was in underground storage tanks. Um, I work primarily as an inspector in BIR, so also, uh, along with Christina, have a lot of uh, extensive knowledge using the SID. Um, before I start, I wanted to just uh, emphasize something that Scott said earlier. Uh, you always want to use the most updated version of the SID. Um, that's really important. If you try to upload those old copies of it into the services, they will not work. Uh, and just a reminder to everybody that the only time a SID is not required with an online service submittal is if you have a PA where you have no potential AOCs identified. Uh, those cases are few and far between, as I'm sure you all know. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start with the general instructions. Um, if you are doing a multi-phase document where you have multiple service submittals at one time, you don't need to create a new SID for each phase. You want to use the most current AOC status achieved for each AOC. Uh, Christine is going to go over that more later. Uh, and then you'll submit that same SID which, with each of the service submissions. So one example of that is an underground storage tank excavation. Your remediation is complete. You're submitting an SI and an RA at the same time. 
Uh, your UST AOC status would be remedial action because that's the latest phase achieved. And so that's what your SID will say. And then you're going to use that SID for both the uh, SI service and the RA service. Next slide, please. So how to list the AOCs on the SID. Uh, you're going to list all of the AOCs associated with a single activity number, LSR, case, whatever you want to call it. It's all the same thing. For each case, you just list the AOCs that go with that case. Uh, you use one row for each area of concern. Don't try to use additional rows for one AOC. The SID will not upload if you try that. Uh, for an AOC only submittal, you only have to include the AOCs for which you're being retained, though there's a few caveats to that statement and we'll try to touch on those uh, later. Next slide, please. When you're creating a uh, SID for an entire site submittal, you want to include all the AOCs, current and historic. For ISRA cases, you have to do all the current and historic AOCs on the site or the property at the time of the ISRA trigger. Uh, Michelle's going to give an example of ISRA cases later, so she'll go over that. Uh, for a remediation in progress waiver application, you need to include all the AOCs, current and historic. And Mike is going to talk about RIP waivers later, so um, he'll give some some more information about that. Um, all AOCs means even those AOCs that don't require an investigation beyond the PA. An example of that is the dumpster on site that's used for recycling cardboard. You might not need to sample it, but it still needs to be on the SID. Next slide, please. When you're creating a SID for an AOC submittal, uh, if you have multiple LSRPs on a case, the department recommends, strongly recommends, that the LSRPs use a master SID that would include everyone's work. We're looking that the LSRPs are cooperating with each other on a remediation. Um, you don't have to use a master SID. We can't force you to. However, at a minimum, please work together to ensure you're not using the same AOC identifiers. You don't want to be overwriting each other's work when you're uploading your submittals via the service. If a PRCR is remediating a site with multiple cases, only list the AOCs for the single case on each associated SID. Next slide, please. So Scott mentioned the comments box in the service. Uh, this is the opportunity for LSRPs to provide any kind of explanations regarding the SID or the online service questions that don't fit neatly into those areas. Um, any information you think the department needs to do the inspection of the uh, document with the most accurate information, you should include that here. Uh, one thing you might want to uh, tell us about is if you have non-sequential AOC numbering, you jump around, you know, one, three, four, five, you might want to explain to us what happened to the other AOCs, because uh, that's something we will be wondering about. Next slide, please. Okay. All right. So I'm, we're going to go back and forth. Next slide. Okay. So I'm going to jump in now and we're going to talk about the columns um, within the SID. And this is where everything begins uh, here at the AOC ID. So, um, here you define what the, what the AOC ID is. So if it's AOC1 or AOC2, AOC A, AOC B, um, that's your decision as long as you use the same unique naming convention. Um, please don't change the AOC ID or duplicate it or leave the column blank um, because I believe that it will not pass through the SID validator. And also that AOC ID can be used as a reference in um, reports and on figures. So it's easy for everybody to understand, you know, what AOC one is because it's on a figure and on a SID and in a report. So that's a little bit about the AOC ID. Next slide. So the AOC type is derived right out of the tech regs. It's subchapter 1.8 and you're going to choose the type of uh, AOC you are dealing with 
from the drop down list. Um, the directions uh, in, that we provided, the new directions, um, specify identifying groundwater as a specific area of concern um, with the conditions listed on this slide. And this may apply to other contaminated media at the site, depending on site specific conditions. Also, I want to mention that if there isn't an AOC type that um, matches exactly what your AOC is, try to find the best AOC type on the list. And I think there is a couple of general AOC types for you to choose from. Next slide. So your AOC description is a concise, unique character description regarding what, um, what the AOC is. So generally speaking, if you have a drum storage pad and you have several of them, you could say northern, drums, northern drum storage pad and southern drum storage pad. Or if you have um, features like piping and drains, you could say floor drains leading to a pretreatment system or floor drains you know, in a janitor's closet that lead to the sanitary sewer. That might be a little too much detail. But if you get my point, it should be a description of what the AOC is. Underground storage tanks, you want to provide the department perhaps with the UST registration record number, the volume and the contents of the tanks we're always going to ask you for. And this could also be a media specific um, description like uh, sediment, uh, PCBs and sediment, excuse me, my support cat here is bothering me. Um, and or you could say uh, chlorinated solvents in groundwater from an offsite source. So those would be just like perfect descriptions, depending on uh, what your AOC is. So here's an example of what we are um, possibly not looking for. This is a lot of content and information here. Some of this probably belongs in the activity column, if it belongs at all. So this is definitely something um, that should be pared down uh, to more minimal description. Here's an example of what we would be looking for. So it's short and simple and to the point, I can tell exactly what your AOC is based on what that description is. I'm not looking for any more information here. So next slide, I'm sorry. I'm gonna back up. Um, next slide, so this is the slide where I was saying, this is an example of, um, of a description that contains too much information. Uh, next slide. And here's an example of um, a description that is short and simple to the point. One more slide, please. And then this is an example of underground storage tanks um, where the department, uh, especially BIR, is looking for a 6,000 gallon gasoline tank, 4,000 gasoline tank, those specifics. We match up against the scope of remediation in your REO and, and we look uh, to reconcile underground storage tanks. Next slide. Okay, it is time for another test your knowledge slide. Um, so the character limit for the AOC description is A, 50, B, 100, C, 500, or D, 3000. Um, so just a reminder, uh, you want to answer this question in the poll section on the side of your screen, not in the question box or the chat box, so you get credit for being here. Um, you have to answer three out of the four quiz questions to get credit. And also, we just want to remind you that the training will be posted on the SRP training page within the next week or so. So if you missed anything uh, today, you will be able to see it again um, next week. Is the poll open? Yes, the poll is open. You have about 20 seconds left. If you haven't voted, again, make sure you're in that poll section where you can select your answer and it will be recorded. You have about five seconds left. It's closing right now. 
All right, so next slide, please. All right, and the answer is C, 500. Next slide. Thanks. Uh, so the confirmed contamination column has four choices. Yes, no, no sampling trigger, and undetermined. I'm going to go over each one uh, for here. Uh, you can select yes, and you should select yes, when contamination is present or has ever been present above the applicable remediation standards. That one is really, really important. Uh, if the AOC required use of a compliance option, if you did a remedial action, or you're going to do a remedial action at the AOC, you should be answering yes. Um, any previously contaminated AOC that received an NFA or an RAO uh, should be yes. Once this column is yes, it should stay yes for the life of the case. So I know this column has been a little controversial and it's part of why we ended up with the new column of excluded from billing. Um, the LSRPs were hesitant to keep this column as a yes because of possible billing implications. Um, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. There are some downstream validations associated with this column. Uh, Scott mentioned them earlier. So when you say yes to confirm contamination, there are several columns in the SID that will also need to be populated. Next slide, please. You can select no for confirmed contamination when there was never any contamination above the applicable remediation standards. Pretty simple. Next slide, please. You can select no sampling trigger when no sampling trigger exists. Uh, some examples are the active rail spur. We obviously don't expect you to go out and sample that. Uh, historic fill only if you're assuming it to be contaminated. Uh, there's some other examples up on the slide and you can refer to the rules and guidance for other situations that might not require sampling. Next slide, please. Lastly, when an AOC hasn't been investigated yet, you can choose undetermined. This was added as a new option and the department expects it only to be used for the PA phase because that's really the only time it's applicable. Uh, we recognize at the PA phase, you might not know if an AOC is contaminated, so undetermined would be appropriate. But once you move off the, AO the PA phase into SI, the column should change to one of the other three options. Next slide, please. So our new column, exclude from billing. Uh, here's a little background the, on why we created it. Uh, the BIR inspectors check the fee billing category, and if it's incorrect, we reach out to the billing unit and have it updated and then we have the PRCR back billed as necessary. Um, inspectors always counted the confirmed contamination is yes for the number of contaminated AOCs to judge what the fee category should be. So we found out through our committee that the LSRPs were hesitant to call AOCs contaminated um, in some instances, like when you did a tank pull and you got all the contamination at one time, you know, when you did your tank yank, um, they were afraid it was skewing the contaminated AOC number, even though maybe that remediation was already done. So in the committee, we agreed to add this column so that the department will now get an accurate representation of the number of contaminated AOCs at the site or at a case, and LSRPs can ensure that the number of contaminated AOCs are correct for their billing count so that the PRCR is paying the right fees and is not gonna go get back uh, billed from the department. So media fees are considered here. The um, BIR knows that if you do make groundwater a separate AOC, we know to count groundwater as a media fee and not to add it to the confirmed contaminated AOC count. Um, the other media additive fees are sediment and groundwater migrating to surface water. So we do know to look for those. Next slide, please. 
If an AOC should be included in the billing, simply leave this column blank. The only time you're gonna fill this in is when an AOC should be excluded from the billing. Uh, if confirmed contamination is yes, and the AOC was included in an NFA or RAO, and no new contamination was identified following that, you can say yes. If an AOC is being remediated and included in the billing under a different case at the site, as in a RIP waiver situation, again, you can say yes. Other circumstances, um, a verified offsite source, you can say yes only after the REO is issued for that verified offsite source. Um, next slide, please. So, the results of adding this column is that when BIR inspectors confirm the billing category, the AOCs with confirmed contamination is yes, will be counted. However, any AOC where you check off yes to exclude from billing, we will not count that AOC. So uh, we have a special message for you from our guest star, Karen Barnes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm here just for extra emphasis of this very important point, um, and just to drive it home. Once you have an AOC, it stays on your SID. But once you have a contaminated AOC, it is always contaminated for the purpose of the SID. And it's just that fact when you have a final remediation document, can you exclude it from your billing? And as Christina and Diane said, there always was that angst as an LSRP filling out that form. Well, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I cleaned this up, but I haven't had an RAO. There's no real contamination left. And yet ended up asking yourself all these mental questions. How do you check the box? Very clear, very straightforward. Once contaminated, always contaminated for the SID. And once you get your final document is when it can come off of the, um, the uh, fee billing documents. So that's it. That's my color commentary for here. I'll see you in a few more slides. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Um, and just one last reminder on this one. To remember to update your fees. Um, if you do miss out on a couple of contaminated AOCs and we realize that we are still going to notify billing, uh, you are still going to have your fee billing category change to be the appropriate category, and they will still back bill your PRCR as necessary. Next slide. Christina. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize the slide changed. <laughs> okay. Um, as Scott mentioned earlier, this used to be uh, the AOC status um, that name designation, and now it's called um, AOC status achieved, and there are many new options that have been added to the dropdown. Uh, this column reflects the status of the investigation or remediation for um, an area of concern at the time of the submission, and the status for each area of concern may be different. So um, when completing an inspection, uh, a BIR inspector is looking for AOCs to have the correct AOC status. Basically, the department is looking for what is left to do or um, what, is, what remediation is still required in an area of concern. And this column, as well as the activity column, helps the inspectors make that determination. So um, this boils down to if you issue an REO with your final SID, then um, the AOCs on that SID should reflect an AOC status achieved for the, the REO. Um, many times we see SIDs that come in and the status is RAR and it hasn't been updated. So um, please update your SID uh, every time that you complete either a remedial phase or you reach a final remedi remedial action to um, reflect the actual correct AOC status. Next slide. This used to be um, status date, now it's status date achieved. Um, this also should be updated per submission. This is the date that the phase document um, was submitted to the department or the date that the department issued an NFA or the LSRP issued an REO. So um, I want to 
re-emphasize what Scott said earlier that the date format for this field is month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. So next slide. Um, this used to just be called incident number and now it is much more specific. <laughs> Uh, all incidents associated with the case, which is otherwise known as the LSR to the department, and you may have seen that, Scott talked about that earlier, should be included in this column. This um, slide lists how incident numbers should be entered into the SID. Um, and most importantly, if there's no incident number associated with an area of concern, leave the field blank. I know Scott mentioned that earlier, but it's really important that if there is not an incident number to please leave. Um, that field blank. Uh, and if you have questions related to what you should do, how to handle an incident number, the department issued a listserv in February of 2019, and that's listed right here on the slide for you. Next slide. So a little bit more on incident numbers. The instructions advise you when not to enter incident numbers, and I'm going to, going to touch on a couple of points uh, from the instructions. Don't add incident numbers that are being handled um, in a different case to the incident number column. So if you're working on a case on a site, excuse me, if you're working on a site that has multiple cases, only include the incident numbers related to the areas of concern in the case you are working on. So if there are AOCs on the SID that do not relate to your case, add those incident numbers associated with those AOCs into the activity column, um, which I'm going to talk more about later. Uh, this allows the department to cross-reference the information in the database. If you enter an incident number that relates to another case on the same site, you will be linking an incident in error and data cleanup will be required. Um, Brandy's going to talk more about dealing with offsite source incident numbers and managing cases for these types of areas of concern. And just one final point is that um, it's widely recognized that for ISRA cases, incident numbers were not necessarily called in or expected. So like I just said a few moments ago, if there's no incident number, leave the column blank and please don't put in the ISRA case number. Next slide. So this is um, this used to be DEP AOC ID. It is now NJ DEP ID, and this column needs to be left blank for the first SID upload. Um, Scott mentioned earlier where you can obtain the NJ DEP ID number. Um, so if there is um, any, if, if there's a change to uh, AOC, the AOC ID, the AOC type, or the AOC description then um, you would enter the NJDEP ID number because then that number would cross-reference with the AOC ID or the type or description so the department would understand um, what the AOC is and the SID would pass through the validator. Next slide. Contaminated media. So Scott mentioned earlier that the instructions are um, going to be updated and should be posted uh, in, within the next day or two. Um, you want to select uh, the contaminated media from the drop dropdown. Uh, if you have multiple media that are or were contaminated, please select mixed media. Um, if confirmed contamination is no or undetermined, leave it blank. That's what the instructions are being updated for. Uh, it currently says none. None is not an option. It's not going to be an option. Um, so please just leave it blank. And thank you to everybody who asked questions about this, because no matter how many times we all looked at these instructions, we all still missed this error. So thank you. Um, if confirmed contamination is yes, then this column should be populated and should remain populated for the life of the case. Next slide, please. Contaminants of concern. You have three columns. It's all drop downs. If you only need one column, leave the other two columns blank. If you need more than three columns, then use the activity column for any overflow. 
Um, none of the drop downs were changed on this, so um, this is the same as you were using it before. Uh, contaminants of concern can be added, but they should never be removed. Next slide. The applicable remediation standard column. If your confirmed contamination is undetermined or no sampling trigger, you can leave this blank. If your confirmed contamination column says yes or no, this column should be populated because it means you sampled and we need to know what you compared those samples to. So the drop down choices are remediation standards, which includes the groundwater quality standards, which are incorporated by reference into the remediation standards. Uh, soil cleanup criteria, which you can only use under the conditions listed. Uh, AOC specific ARS. Uh, if you use that, we would really appreciate that you give us a little more detail in the activity column, and Christina will talk about that later. Um, or AOC specific ARS and the remediation standards. Next slide, please. For exposure route, um, I don't think there were any changes to the drop downs. You have two columns you can use. Again, if you don't need the second column, leave it blank. If you need more than two, use the activity column. Um, examples of the exposure route, groundwater, surface water, overland flow, uh, ingestion dermal. Next slide. Remedial action type. So we're, uh, we have two columns for this. There's a lot of drop down choices for interim, current, or previous remedial action types. I'm sure you'll be able to find something that fits what you did. Um, if you're not at the remedial action phase yet, then leave it blank. If a remedial action was not required, there's a drop down for that. Uh, again, if you need more than two columns, use the activity section for any kind of overflow. Next slide, please. And order of magnitude. If your confirmed contamination column is yes, then this column should be populated. The drop down choices are on the slide. Uh, not applicable was added to reflect when an order of magnitude evaluation is not warranted for the phase of the remediation or for the AOC. So we've been asked the question of what should be reported when an order of magnitude evaluation was completed. We suggest that you include a brief description of the results of that evaluation in the activity column. Um, being a little more detailed up front in the SID in the, and using that activity column for that, it clarifies that the evaluation was completed and that any RLs or new standards were considered. Um, for additional information, you can see the department's order of magnitude guidance document. Next slide, please. Welcome back, Karen. Hello again. Um, here for some more emphasis. Um, Diane and Christina have been talking a lot about the activity column and what to put in the activity column. Uh, I call this resist the urge. Maybe you, like me, understand that the inspectors don't necessarily read your entire document. And previously I had this urge to put the history of the world in the activity column here. Um, I think if you advance the slide a little bit, you'll see a red, a red column there in the activity column. I wanted to tell you when I did soil borings, when I repeated them, what the compounds were, how I stepped out, you know, what I even defined acronyms in this activity column. You really don't need all of that. They don't need the history of the world. There's enough clues from the previous columns here. For this example, my area of concern is historic fill. The inspectors know typically what compounds of concern are associated with historic fill. You don't have to walk them through the entire um, process there. Resist that urge to take your entire history and copy and paste it into the activity column. Uh, if you advance to the next slide, here's a more concise version of what it is. Tell them that you did some soil samples, you found a few of the historic fill compounds, and then what your next steps in this one, this phase would be, we would just do the next phase for the remedial investigation. So please resist the urge to copy your entire site history into this column and just keep it to the pertinent information. These folks know what they're looking for. Thank you, Karen. See you soon. Okay, 
Next slide, please. So as Karen just mentioned, the purpose of this column is to provide us with some concise and, and critical details, um, but just not to uh, give us the full details. They should be included in your phase document. Use this column to support the AOC description as needed, as I was trying to explain earlier. Um, explain receptor issues here. Um, put in the details of compliance options, uh, the development of site-specific standards, or an incident number related to uh, another case at the same site. And these are just a few examples. What we don't need to know are um, details, like there have been 96 rounds of groundwater sampling and 230 soil samples collected over the lifetime of the case. That kind of detail can be in the report. Next slide. Um, I just said, uh, use this column to discuss receptors. And as I mentioned in the uh, AOC status achieved slide, you want to explain what is next. What is the department looking for? Um, we're looking for understanding whether remediation is complete or not. Uh, that way, um, the reader, which could be your client or a BIR inspector understands um, exactly what still requires remediation um, based on the information provided in the SID, if anything at all. So uh, the last point is uh, when I said, you know, concise, I think Scott did mention that there's a 4,000 uh, character limit. Otherwise, the SID won't um, pass through the validator or upload. So please, you know, take that into consideration. You will be unable to put anything beyond 4,000 characters. And if it really takes that much to explain what's going on for an area of concern, then it really needs to be in the report. Next slide. So this is general contact information. If you have questions um, related to SID content specifically, um, you could contact uh, BIR through the email address at the top. Um, Scott talked about the SID conversion uh, email address, and remember that that is not a person you're emailing. It's it's just an automated process that needs to include your SID to be converted. And if you have issues, um, that's the third bullet is the support um, email that you can reach out to Scott and his team, and they'd be more than happy to help you upfront and through the process. Next slide. We are on to questions. All right, yes, we have a lot of questions. Um, as Lynn said earlier, if we don't get to your question, no worries, it will get answered um, via email. So I'm going to get through as many of these as we can. Uh, the first one is for multi-phase reports, wouldn't you need to update the second SID to include the DEP ID, assuming the first upload is the first time a doc has been submitted? If you leave that uh, DEP ID blank, it will still upload. Okay. Um, is it possible for LSRPs to download the latest SID that was last submitted from the data miner or DEP online? No. I don't believe so, no. Yes. Oh, well, thank you, Scott. <laughs> There's a data miner report for uh, downloading the SIDs that were uploaded to a case. Okay. Great, good information. All right, the next question is, the presentation indicated that only AOCs associated with the LSR activity number should be included on the SID. This seems counter to the instructions with multiple ISRA cases, which will be separate LSR numbers. Should we be cross-listing AOCs that are associated with different LSR activities, but under the same PI? Um, Michelle is going to do an ISRA example in a little bit, so I think she will clear that up. Okay. Um, if a SID has been submitted with a remedial phase document with an AOC description that is too long, can it be changed for the next upload for a remedial phase document? The AOC description can be minimized for a, a, a follow-up SID. What can't be changed, what we're asking you not to change is the AOC ID. Okay. 
does every AOC have to go on the SID? Um, it was unclear. A dumpster only for cardboard requires no further investigation, yet they said it had to go on the SID. Please clarify. A dumpster would be a potential SID, uh, a potential AOC. So if, you're go if your intention is to do an entire site RAO at the end of the day, we would want to know that you had that, you had identified that there was that dumpster there and you made some kind of an evaluation. We certainly exactly. do not expect you to sample for a dumpster that only contained cardboard. You just have to identify that you, you have to include that you identified it. Right. If you if you identified it in a preliminary assessment for an entire site submission, then yes, it belongs on the SID. Okay. Um, if you issue an AOC specific RAO to drop down to a lower category of COOCs, should you still say yes for confirmed for confirmed contamination for these AOCs that have been RAO'd and then just say exclude from billing? Absolutely, yes. The SID is being submitted with the RAR. Should you say RAR even though you are about to submit the RAO in a few days, or RAR SID should have RAO as that is technically the latest status? Only SID with RAO should have RAO as status. So, I mean, that's a, that's a, an interesting situation if you're going from the RAR and the RAO being within days one of one another. Um, I'm trying to think of process, Diane, for BIR, like how that would come in. I think you would give the RAR the RAR status and you would give the RAO the RAO status because the phase document would get reviewed at the time that the RAO um, was being inspected and we would be looking for the most updated version and it would be fine. It, it should reflect the correct status in that in that case scenario you're giving me. I agree with that answer. And you know, sometimes things happen and you think you're gonna issue the REO within a couple days and then maybe you get delayed and it might not be issued when you want. So please keep that RAR as the RAR status and change the status for that final, the SID that goes with your um, final REO. You can update your status achieved for that. How does the contaminated AOC box apply in an area where compliance averaging finds the AOC meets unrestricted use standards? If you used a compliance option, you had contamination and your contamination confirmed contamination should be answered yes. If an incident is reported after a UST is removed because holes were observed in the tank, but the res results were less than the remediation standards, should confirmed contamination be yes or no? If you were less than the remediation standards, then you can say no. On exclude from billing, if an AOC is identified as contaminated, but is from another AOC, that extends onto this AOC, how do we prevent double counting of the contamination, i.e. sample at UST, but turns out contamination is historic fill? So you can say the exclude from billing is yes on that, and in the activity, you should explain that the UST was not contaminated, the contamination that was identified is from historic fill, and reference the AOC number. Um, with regard to NJD PID numbers, when you say leave blank on the first upload, are you referring to the first upload of the new SID or the first ever upload? I don't think I understand the question. Do you, Diane? I mean, it's like you, I'm not sure I understand the question. Scott, are you there? Uh, yeah, yes. I figured Scott would be. I think Scott should be on for this one. It's the first upload to that case. Um, and again, you can click, um, you can go ahead and run an AOC report, um, you know, to see whether anything's ever been loaded to that case before. 
if you're not sure. It'll okay. it'll just tell you it's you know if you don't have it, then leave it blank. Um, there are only four sample AOC tracking AOCs on this spreadsheet. Can the department provide more examples on successful completion of various types of AOCs that have been addressed throughout this LSRP program? Providing more sample AOC tracking AOCs would provide much more clarification to the LSRPs. Are you talking about examples? Not. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're asking. I think AOC tracking isn't that a, was that a tab in the yeah. in this so that example add examples? Tab? With just a few AOCs, uh, I guess, you know, they want to see more examples. Um, Diane, have we just, I don't remember discussing in committee that we were adding additional AOCs as an example. Do you? I don't. Scott, is that something that you would consider for one of the next renditions? One of the ne I think next. We would if there were scenarios that we wanted to cover, we would add them to the instructions. Okay. So if okay. there are scenarios people would like us to cover, I think they should, you know, submit them to BIR and then we can add them to future instructions. Or put them in the course evaluation. We're going to read those <laughs> too. So, I mean, that's just a suggestion. All right, um, are we supposed to include both exposure route and contamination pathways under the exposure route column. Yes, um, just select from the drop downs that are there. Um, if your confirmed contamination is yes, then you should be filling out that column. Does DEP prefer the activity column to be filled out and separated by phase? So a description of the PA, a separate description of the SI, et cetera. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that that's necessary. I mean, if if you're coming in with with a a full suite of reports that starts at the PA to the REO, I, you can write it however you like. But as long as it's written so that you know we understand um, what happened, I don't think it's important to point out that a PA and SI like what you did at each phase. On our end, we see in the on, from what you submit in the online services that a PA was submitted and an SI was submitted, you know, right through to the end of the remedial process. So if that helps you parse it out um, and still give us concise and critical information, fine. However, it's not necessary. Okay, um, for the activity section, can we reference certain sections of our phase report for detailed discussions? There are a few questions about that. Absolutely, and that's a, that's a great way for us to locate information or BIR to locate information um, when, when looking at um, the form that, that B, the BIR inspector looks at versus the SID. So if we know that um, you use the compliance option and you point to that it's on page 23 of the report, that's something I, that a BIR inspector would have to go looking for anyway. So thank you um, for bringing up that point because it's an excellent way for us to reference where things are. All right, we have a few more questions here. Um, do unregulated heating oil tanks still go on the SID when there are also other AOCs for the site? Yes. Um, if it's an ISRA case, definitely. Uh, and I don't, if you're, if you're dealing with that area of concern and you're going to include it in, in a, in a response action outcome, which I believe you can do, um, which you definitely can do, uh, you, you would definitely want to include it in, in the SID as an AOC. If the AOC was investigated as part of a historical investigation and through the LSRP evaluation of the AOC, there is conclusion that this AOC has some exceedances. Would this AOB, AOC be categorized as an AOC with confirmed contamination? Yes. Yeah. 
All right, I think that is, oh, there's a couple more. They just keep popping up. <laughs> is there an exposure route when historic fill has already been capped? Um, there was an exposure route, so you should fill in what the exposure route was. Um, how do we access prior SIDS through data miner? Scott? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. So it's the first entry in the site remediation data miner uh, area category. Um, go to the case tracking uh, section. And then under the case tracking section, it's called case inventory documents and associated AOCs by PI number and case activity. So when you run that, you need your PI number and then the case that you're interested in. So it's that LSR number again. And then there are tabs in there. So this gives a summary of what AOCs have been uploaded before. And also in another tab, there are links that have a download um, button or download link that you can click to download the actual spreadsheets or older ones, you know, maybe PDFs or what have you. But um, if there's one that you know is at that activity, but you don't see it, um, it could be because we don't have it categorized as a SID in our system. And um, you can contact NJDP online support and, you know, we can look into that. But um, I believe a, a, a listserv went out uh, in October of 2020 um you know announcing this report so please go in and use it all right thank you scott for jumping in on some of those questions and uh thank you diane and christina um we are going to move forward now up next we have mike Cristiniano again and he's going to be discussing remediation and progress waivers so mike whenever you're ready you can take over Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Mike Hustiano. I'm with the <clears throat> Bureau of Field Operations, the Southern Field Office. Um, but just for some context, uh, uh, up until December and from the start of the LSRP program, I was with BIR and uh, part of my duties were to, uh, as a supervisor, uh, overseeing the remediation and progress waivers. Um, <clears throat> I've also had had extensive uh, ISRA experience early in my career, uh, where I worked in the ISRA program for about 20 years. So, uh, next slide. Okay, so um, I guess I do want to emphasize one thing, and that is uh, this isn't intended to be a training on remediation and progress waivers. It's a SID training. Um, obviously, there'll, there'll be some context for remediation and progress waivers, but um, I, I just want to be clear that um, I'm not touching on everything that's involved in the remediation and progress waiver. Uh, I'm limiting it to uh, as it pertains to the uh, case inventory document. So the first thing is um, where does a uh, remediation progress waiver apply? Um, it applies to ISRA cases where there is a previously existing and active ISRA case. So um, a very common scenario is uh, particularly uh, particularly with uh, uh, things like pharmaceuticals, those types of operations where they go through mergers. Um, so you may have a, um, a case that's existing, um, there's a sale of the business, uh, and some years later, there's some other merger or sale, and now there are, are new AOCs to deal with in the new case. Um, that's a common scenario. Um, as a rule of thumb, you'll have uh, the previously existing 
uh, an active ISRA case that occupy uh, the overlapping footprint. Uh, so where would something be that uh, where this may not apply? If, for instance, you have something like an industrial park where you have one building where a tenant ceased operations and they're ongoing, but then later on, and there's another ISRA trigger for a different tenant, totally different uh, leasehold, totally different part of the industrial park. Uh, that wouldn't apply in, in, in this type of scenario. Um, and I explained that because of the second bullet here, which is that um, all the AOCs that pertain to the ISRA case that you're looking at, that may be applying for the RIP waiver, the remediation progress waiver, have to be included in the SID, in the uh, case inventory document, but you also need to include all of the AOCs from the previous case, okay? So from the previous case where you have a, an overlapping footprint, um, in other words, there's still AOCs that are being uh, remediated by a previous uh, responsible party or person responsible for conducting the mediation, all of those need to be included on the SID. And I'll show you, you know, how that'll look. So next slide. Okay, we've got a... Okay, got all a right, I am back, everybody. We are testing your knowledge one more time. So for a true or false question, remediation in progress waivers do not apply to situations where there is a previously existing and active ISRA case. Is that true or false? Your poll is now open. Please select one of them. And while you are taking this time to answer this question, I just want to take the opportunity to let you know that we have some upcoming training events. Uh, we plan on doing a training event on remediation standards and updates to VI guidance um, in 2021. We plan on hopefully doing a training on um, an REO guidance because we're hoping to uh, release that shortly. And um, if all goes well, a soil wrap guidance as well. Um, in addition, we will be having ISRA, um, uh, sorry, GIS training. So uh, please take the time to, again, comment in the in your um, survey monkey regarding the remediation standards. The link is um, will be made available towards you again. Um, please uh, give us any suggestions for anything else that you feel we should be including in our training. And we are now done with test your knowledge. And the correct answer is, next slide, it was false. OK. So um, what I'm going to do here is just go through a uh, short, uh, a short uh, case inventory document here. And this includes a mix of AOCs that are being addressed by the current um, ISRA trigger, as well as AOCs addressed uh, that are being addressed by a, by a uh, existing case or, or, or a prior case. Okay, so in this example on this screen, you'll see there are three AOCs um, here. Uh, it's at the PA phase, and in this uh, circumstance, the LSRP is deemed that there's no sample trigger. Uh, next date, uh, next slide. And you'll see really the typical of what you would see in, uh, in any uh, case inventory document, uh, especially as pertaining to the activity cell where the the uh, justification the reasoning for the no sampling trigger is explained next slide now here what you'll see is two aocs where this is being handled in a previous case 
So here in particular, if you look at the AOC status, you'll see that uh, there's an AOC status for RIP waiver, and that will signal to the inspector who looks at this that um, those particular AOCs are being handled elsewhere. They're being handled in the previous case. Um, what you'll also see here is you'll also see in the, the uh, new exclude from billing uh, column that these are tagged yes, so that um, when an inspector looks at this, it wouldn't be included in the billing. Um, now, this is a simple case that I'm presenting here. Um, so for this one, it's uh, it's your, your your standard uh, billing fee, but we do get in uh, we do get in-house rip waivers where there's been sampling, where there's been remediation, uh, and um, and so you know this becomes important. Okay, next slide. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, this, so this here, I just highlighted some areas where um, in the activity cell where this particular LSRP just made it very plain that, yeah, this is an AOC uh, that's being handled in a different case. And um, I highlight this one, this was from a real uh, CID um, where the LSRP did a pretty good job at explaining and saying this is from the previous case so and so lsrp is handling that and it's being handled under that case and he provided identifiers um, he just made it very very plain very obvious um, for <clears throat> for our review okay next slide okay so uh just as a again a quick summary for any RIP waivers, you need to disclose all of the AOCs. They all need to be listed in the SID. Um, the AOC status for, uh, for AOCs that are being handled on a previous case or on a prior open case would be RIP waiver. And uh, similarly for those, you can select yes for the exclude AOC uh, from billing column. Uh, next slide. Okay, questions. Okay, so um, I will be answering the questions this time. And um, Peter Sawchuk, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I don't actually see, have a question in your, um, it seems more like a statement. Um, so can you please retype your question and I will I'll read it when you correct it down below. Um, as an L so the first question to you, Mike, is as an LSRP on an old ISRA case, I'm contracted by opt-in for only three of the remaining AOCs. Do I submit a SID for only those AOCs, even though the prior SIDs were uploaded with site-wide AOCs listed? So I'm not sure that I caught the question, but so if if um, if if you are submitting an AO uh, a SID in support of remediation and progress waiver, you need to include all of the AOCs. Part of our review process is that we um, ensure that all of the AOCs at the at the site are being addressed or at the leasehold are being addressed. So what threw me off in that question, uh, I think it said as an LSRP of an old case, that kind of threw me off a little bit. Um, I, I think but, the question was that they're only, this doesn't seem to be, the more I, re I read this, this question um, seems to not be for a RIP waiver because they're saying they were only, um, they were only, it's an opt-in case where they only have three AOCs. That wouldn't be for a RIP waiver, correct? No, that sounds like it's for a RIP waiver. Um, but okay. you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, uh, and in, 
you know, take a stab at that as well. Because for, I mean, for any ISRA case, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to want to show that all of the AOCs have been remediated. Um, so, uh, yeah, you would need to include all of your AOCs. As a general rule of thumb, 40 ISRA cases, you need to include all the AOCs. And uh, Brandy's going to talk about that in, in her presentation. So she can cover that in more detail there. Um, seems like there was a question regarding um, the example you have on the screen. Why is the status to achieve date just a few days apart for the different AOCs? Was that just the way you decided to create your sheet? Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was an example that that I grabbed. I don't remember if I if I played with the dates or not. I just, you know, frankly, I saw it was a pretty good uh, SID that was submitted for the uh, for that particular mediation and progress waiver, and I decided to, you know, doctor it up a little bit and use it as an example. All right. So this slide with your example of the RIP waiver showed no confirmed contamination, although the activity section says remediation being conducted. So it should have been yes for confirmed contamination, correct? Yeah. 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 Sorry for the mistake, everybody. Um, for an AOC status in, in older cases, is the date status achieved, the date when a remedial phase document was approved by the department? or the date when the LSRP certified the remedial document? For an older case. Again, it's not related to the to the RIP waiver, but um, so, so, so we're Does talking about else? some case, yeah. Christina, Diane? Can you repeat the question, please? Um, for an old case, would the date, I think they just deleted the question for me, but did, was the date of the submission uh, with the status of the of the column be the date they, the department approved the submission? Oh, here it is. For an AOC, um, is the date status achieved the date when a remedial phase document was approved by the department? The department doesn't approve remedial phase documents. It's we the date that it was we submitted the to past. the department. So we won't, but no, but when we did in the past. We're we're about that. We, that wouldn't be, that, that wouldn't be reflected in a SID unless. Are you so talking about when the NFA was approved? If so, the date of the NFA approval. Correct. But a remedial phase document if, if an RAR was approved prior to Sarah, then it would be the date that the department approved that. And, you know, I presume that you would include that as an appendix in your report. So we'd be able to cross reference that. Okay. Is there a way to get the SID conversion email to stop? I'm getting the same emails from the system over and over again with the not corrected format. I think that's a specific question to Mangle that you should contact um, BIS directly. Yeah. Just so um, you know, how do you if you have a lot of um, embedded images in your email, it's they're all attachments and it tries to convert every one. So you can remove those uh, before you send the SID, SID for conversion. Okay. How do you address an AOC that was historical part of a RIP waiver and still active as part of the current ISRA case? That was historically part of a RIP waiver and still part of an active ISRA case? I guess there was a previous uh, RIP waiver. It, right. So so if I if I understood the question correctly, I would so I'm gonna rephrase the question, which is what I what I think I'm hearing is how would you include an active AOC for an active case, but that happened to be included in a RIP waiver somewhere along the line? Um, same mm -hmm. way, you tag it as a RIP waiver, um, you would exclude from billing, and you would explain in the activity cell um, where it is that the AOC is being addressed. 
Do we have to use the same AOC ID number for the AOCs of previous cases, which will be indicated by me as a RIP waiver? You don't need to use the same AOC ID, but somewhere in the activity cell, you should at least um, mention the AOC ID used in the previous case so that the reviewer can do a cross-reference and, and know that it's being handled and how it's being identified in the other case. Okay, and um, um, seeing if there's any more here. Um, this will be my last one because I want to make sure we get to the examples. Um, Uh, what about historic ISRA cases that achieved regulatory, regulatory closure, not RIP waivers? Does the department want these closed AOCs to be included on the SID? Um, obviously, these would need to be discussed uh, regarding order of magnitude evaluation as part of the initial PA, but should these be on the SID as well? Yes. Yeah, and um, I think Brandy's presentation gets into that where she hits a few <clears throat> order of magnitude examples. But yeah, for the purposes of the RIP waiver, um, they they should be included as well. And, and so I'm just gonna add one more thing. Um, please confirm that the status achieved date should reflect the date that the report was submitted. Yes, it should reflect the date the report was submitted to the department. Thank you. Okay. And that will end our questions for this section. Um, I will now take the thank you, Mike, for your time and effort in this. And we're now going to go to Michelle Martin. So, Michelle, Good thank morning. you very much. And you're on. Thanks. Um, again, I'm Michelle Clifford Martin. I'm a PE and an LSRP with GEI Consultants. Um, we're going to do a run through of an example ISRA CID this morning um, and go through some of the stumbling blocks and things that make ISRA a little trickier. Um, let me start off. We've already had plenty of questions about this, and it's one of the biggest issues that we see with ISRA CIDs is forgetting to list all of the historic AOCs. For ISRA, you are required to list all of your current ones that you identified on your, your site inspection and all of the historic AOCs previously triggered on that property or leasehold your ISRA uh, industrial establish establishment. We've talked about some other cases where you only list AOCs associated with your LSR or activity. ISRA is not one of those. If you have a site-wide RAO that you are going to issue, you need to list all of the historic AOCs. Everybody got that now? All right. So when you start listing some of your historic AOCs, you might come across some goofy names that you're gonna wanna update and that's fine. Um, in the, oops, next slide, please. In this example, there was a former area B that was identified as part of a 1968 triggering event. Um, today, you wanna call that AOC one, that's fine. You can rename that as AOC1 in the AOC ID column and then just mention that um, link in the activities. You can easily rename an AOC once. After you've uploaded them to the system, you should not go changing the name around a million times. You want to keep it consistent as one AOC ID once you've given it that. And as we've mentioned a couple of times too, AOC-1 should always be AOC-1 and you can't change it to AOC-1 space or the system will start to make duplicates. Next slide, please. Another way to help prevent these duplicates and make sure that your AOC ID matches is to use that NJDEP ID column. This is super helpful if you're going to change the name of an existing AOC. As Scott mentioned, this number is generated when you first submit your CID and it's unique to each AOC. So it's one more layer that the system can check to make sure that you're not duplicating. Um, these IDs will pop up during your first submission. So Obviously, when you put your first CID in, you will not have them, but then going forward, you can add this. It's just one more thing to check. Um, just note, these were previously called the EPAOC numbers. Um, so if you're looking at something older, it's the same thing. It's just now called the NJDEP ID. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so again, the biggest issue that we see is not listing all the historic AOCs. Now we've talked about that. We've talked about how to make sure you're not duplicating them. Um, now we're just gonna go through some of the stumbling blocks when you're actually filling out the CID. Um, you're gonna start it out like anything else. You're gonna list your AOCs, your types, your IDs. The first somewhat tricky column you're gonna come to is that confirmed contamination. As we've mentioned several times today, if any contamination is present or has ever been present above the applicable remediation standards, including background, you're gonna check yes, even if that AOC has a prior NFA or RAO. So for this one, we have AOC one, it was previously impacted and received an NFA, but I still check yes in the confirmed contamination. I know this makes all of you wanna cringe, I know you don't like it, but that's a big reason that we added that exclude from AOC billing column. So then you can check yes in that column and you will not get billed for that. This allows the LSRPs to provide the DEP the information they are actually looking for regarding the prior contamination while also making sure everybody's content that we're not getting billed for it. And then obviously if you sampled and there was no contamination present, you check no. And if you have an AOC that had no sampling trigger, such as a AST and secondary containment with no staining, or one of these examples of the loading area, concrete looked good, no signs of discharge, you would just check no sampling trigger. We also now have an undetermined status, which means that the AOC hasn't been investigated yet. This can only apply when you're in your PA phase and <clears throat> might be for something, you identified floor drains, but you need to video inspect them to decide if you need to sample or not. Then you would check undetermined there. Next slide. Thank you. So as we continue across the CID spreadsheet, um, the next set of columns that can get tricky is the AOC status. Again, we've had a couple of questions about this already. In this example, AOC3 was identified in a 2019 site inspection and found to be in good condition. Therefore, it's in the PA phase and the date of the PA submission is listed. This will carry through on the CID for all of the other submissions until you get to the REO. For AOC6, this AOC is now in the RI phase. It has gone through the PASI, but they aren't listed because the most recent status is the RI. So the RI date is listed with the RI report. Next slide, please. And then for closed AOCs, you list the date of the final remediation document. So here, AOC2 received an NFA in 1998 and then was no longer used. So it doesn't get bumped up to the PA because it, it didn't exist when you did your PA inspection. But AOC6 in this instance also received that NFA and then was continued to be used. And let's say it had a leaking nozzle out of the AST. So now you are doing additional investigation and remediation. So it is now listed as the RI phase. Just make a note that that NFA existed, but it is no longer in the NFA phase. Next slide, please. And then one more thing for is for cases that comes up a lot is that order of magnitude evaluation. The options for this column are pretty straightforward. You select yes if the order of magnitude was evaluated. And like everyone has mentioned, just make a quick note in the activity column saying it was done and that you don't need to do anything else. Or if you do need to address something, just make a quick note. You can select no if it was not conducted and then you've got the um, not applicable if this option isn't warranted for the space of remediation. Next slide. And that is it for your quick run through on how to fill out an issue of CID. Okay, we have a couple questions here. Uh, the first one is, an ISRA case submits an RAR and RAO for a certain number of AOCs, and there are still outstanding AOCs that need to be addressed. Do you identify the AOCs that an RAO is issued as exclude AOC from billing as yes? Yes, if you submitted that final document, then you can pull them out, yes. Okay, and the next question is, is the SID the primary inspection and enforcement document used by the department? When a site inspection visit is done by the department, have the reports been reviewed or only the SID? Are NOVs being issued based on the SIDs? This like might be a question. Person question. Yeah. Okay, so I am listening. This is Christina. Um, can you repeat that again, just because yep. it was a is mouthful. The SID the primary 
is the SID the primary inspection enforcement document used by the department? When a site inspection visit is done by the department, have the reports been reviewed or only the SID? Are NOVs being issued based on the SID? Okay, okay, so that's question. not a. Lane, you that's, wanna, it's not even related to, the, to this part of the presentation. So, and it's it's not related to the sit itself. That is related to what BFO does, and during their site visits, and they have access to all the information. And what the site inspector chooses to look at is up to them. Okay. Um, for a new ISRA trigger at a site with a previous RAO, should the status date be for the previous RAO or for the PA for the new ISRA case? It's sort of AOC by AOC specific. If that AOC is not around anymore, you would use the RAO date. If you inspected it as part of your PA, then you're going to list it as in the new PA date. And it just reference that an RAO does exist. Okay, I think I think that's all the questions right now for this specific part of the presentation. Um, so I think we are going to move on. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, so up next we have uh, Brandy Gray. She's an LSRP with Langan, and she's going to discuss. Um, the SID when there are um, off-site sources and impacts to multiple media. So Brandy, you're up. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brandy Gray. Uh, I'm an LSRP and a senior project manager at Langen. And as Alyssa said, I'm gonna walk you through an example SID to show you how to document multimedia impacts and off-site source use of alternative remediation standards and an attainment method to demonstrate compliance. Next slide. So just to give you a little bit of background for the example so you can follow along, um, in this case, we have two AOCs that have soil impacts that have been remediated and an RAOA for soil has been issued. Sediment and groundwater have also been impacted as a result of discharges at these AOCs. But in order to close out those soil impacts, two new AOCs, one for each media, so one for sediment and one for groundwater uh, were established. Additionally, a fifth AOC was added for off-site source impacts. Next slide. So here you see we have AOC 1 and AOC 2, which, as I said, they were the two AOCs where soils have been uh, remediated. The confirmed contamination box is checked yes, and an RAOA has been issued, which is selected in the AOC status achieved column. Because the RAOA was issued for soil, annual fees for those AOCs are no longer required, as such yes is selected under the exclude AOC from billing column. In the activity column, you can see the highlighted text. Um, it, there's a discussion there related to other impacted media for these AOCs, and it refers you to the relevant AOC within the SID. So again, this example, AOC 3, um, has been identified to address the sediment impacts, and AOC 4 has been identified to address the groundwater impacts. Next slide. So um, we've moved on to the SID, and here's the AOC 3 and AOC 4, which, as I said, address the remaining media impacts associated with AOCs 1 and 2. Yes is selected for confirmed contamination, and exclude AOC from billing is left blank. Um, I want to note that AOC 3 and AOC 4 are not contaminated soil AOCs and will not be counted towards your fee billing category, but they are counted as media fees. So looking at you know, the AOCs one through four in this example, the inspector would be able to determine that this case has an annual fee associated with a category one, which is zero to one contaminated soil AOCs with two media, one for sediment and one for groundwater. And as we move along um, the columns, then you can see that the AOC status achieved, contaminated media exposure route, RA type, all those columns have been completed. I also want to point out that previously in the contaminated media column, you had to select mixed media when you had sediment impacts within the AOC, um, but now sediment is, is a standalone option and, and can be selected. I know that uh, some confusion in the past um, with what to do when you had sediment. Next slide. 
So moving on to the offsite source piece. Um, in this particular example, we have um, a case where chromium impacts were identified in groundwater that are related to an offsite source. Um, an unknown offsite source discharge was called into the department and um, it was provided, that was your initial incident communication number. Um, a separate AOC was then established in the SID. So in this, in this particular example, um, it's AOC 5. And once the impacts were confirmed, the discharge was called into the department a second time as a verified offsite source, which this is your second incident number. And we usually use this second number um, in our RAO notices to state that, you know, there's these um, additional offsite source impacts. Uh, yes, is selected for the confirmed contamination and should be included in the billing until our, the RAO is issued for this AOC. So this is very important that this should be selected until the RAO is issued, and we've talked about this a few times. Um, the initial incident number is placed under the Incident Communication Center Numbers Managed, in this case, column, which is a mouthful to say, <laughs> and the verified offsite source incident number should be documented in the activity column. This is very important that you complete it this way. Um, there are... There are some cases, though, that predate the, the guidance for addressing unknown offsite sources for contamination. Um, and in that case, you would only have one incident number. Only in those cases, you would leave the incident, uh, incident number column blank, and you would place that incident number in the activity column. Uh, next slide. So as you can see in this slide, the verified unknown source incident number is listed in the activity column. And just to reiterate, this should only be the verified unknown offsite source incident number that is listed in the activity column, which is your second number that you call in. The only exception to this are cases that predate the unknown offsite source guidance. And in those cases, you leave the incident column blank and place the initial incident number in the activity column. Next slide. And we have a quiz question. Yep. Hello. Okay, I'm here for the last quiz question. Um, true or false, the verified offsite source incident number should be included in the activity column. True or false? So your, poll your polling starts now. Please answer. Um, and while you are doing that, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the DEP presenters as well as um, the other presenters that we have, Mark Fisher, Karen Barnes, um, Michelle Martin, and Brandy Gray. We could not have done this without you, without your help uh, of the entire committee um, that was mentioned earlier in Mike's slide. Um, this presentation would not have been possible, so I appreciate everybody's help in accomplishing this. It's amazing how long one minute can be when I am when I have to talk like this. So I'm going to say also use this time to remind everybody to um, fill out the Survey Monkey. Uh, you can also add during that Survey Monkey of any other trainings that you feel that we are that we should accomplish. Uh, three more minutes to go. All right, everybody, we're done. Sorry, the answer was true. Next slide. Thanks, Lynn. So this next slide provides an example on how to document use of alternative remediation standards and an attainment method. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You're going to select other in the additional RA type, and you put the details in the activity column. And again, these details should be very brief. If you feel the need to provide additional commentary, you can reference um, the phase document and where to find that information. So for this example, um, it's documented that SPLP was used to eliminate the IGW pathway for benzene, and the, a the ARS form was submitted in April 2019. Additionally, compliance averaging was used to reduce the area requiring remediation. The activity column states what attainment method was used when the remedial action work plan was submitted. It talks about soil removal and when the remedial action report and response action outcome were submitted. Next slide. And that's it, any questions? Okay, we do have some questions and again, um, 
we will try to get through with what we have here. Um, if it is a verified off-site source, then would we remove this from the fee billing column? The answer to that is no until you issue an RAO for, RAOA for that AOC. Yeesh. Okay, wait, things are moving here. Um, uh, what occurrence triggers the initial call in for the off-site source to become verified? Um, so I, I would refer you to the guidance. There's there's very specific details there on when to call in. You do the initial um, call in number and when you um, have a verified um, offsite source. Right, we have so many questions. Um, it's um, should for an AOC should separate AOC IDs be established for each each contaminated media at that AOC? No. Um, so you can, I, I think Christina touched this in her presentation, um, when to create separate media specific um, AOCs in your case inventory document. Um, an example of that, which is what I provided where an, um, an RAOA was issued for soil um, and I wanted to get we wanted to get that out of um, the B filling so we could reduce our category. Um, so in order to continue um, remediating that AOC, which had groundwater and sediment impacts, we created a new AOC to address those, those media impacts. Okay, um, all right. Um, we now have, we're getting a lot of other questions that don't pertain to you. So I hope that we have some other people that are listening. We just have a few more minutes left, um, but Scott, can a SID that is downloaded as a spreadsheet from data miner be submitted to the converter to be populated into the current version of the SID spreadsheet? Uh, SID versions 1.3 and 1.4 can be downloaded and submitted as long as there are the Excel versions of it. Um, there are some PDF versions that are available through that download. And obviously, we can't get the information out of the PDF to convert it. Okay. Um, um, so, Mike, are you around? For a RIP waiver, what if I repeat an AOC? Say, some form of us, do I create a new number for the same tanks? Seems like this would cause more confusion. I'm, I'm really not clear why you would make the same AOC twice. I, I'm, reread the question. I'm, I'm not sure I understood it. it. It says for a RIP waiver, what if I repeat an AOC? Again, I don't know why they were repeating it. Um, say a former tank, do I create a new number for the same tanks? Seems like this would cause more confusion. Definitely sounds like it's confusing, Brian. Seems like it would so, be a question to just ask BIR directly if you yep. have that issue. Thank you. Yeah, so, so that, that sounds like an order of magnitude question to me. Um, what And someone had asked before about the AOC identifier, if they need to make it consistent with how it was identified previously. So previously I answered, no, you can assign it your own case number, but you at least in the activity column have to provide a cross-reference to what it was called before so that the reviewer can match it up. So hopefully that answers the question. If not, uh, you know, we'll try again. All right, so at this point, um, I will invite back my co-moderator. Um, I'm sorry that we were not able to answer everybody's questions during this presentation. This we have received more questions today than we have ever received in any of the trainings that I've ever been part of. Um, we will do our best to try to answer your questions, but each of the presenters um, throughout the presentation, there were emails that you can um, send your questions directly to the bureaus, so that would work as well. Um, and I want to thank you for coming, Alyssa. Yeah, I mean, I think that's everything. We'll answer your questions, and uh, don't forget to complete the course evaluation. I'll put it in the chat box uh, once again, so you can click directly on it. It's really helpful for us going forward, and it helps us help you. Um, so thank you and stay safe. Thanks everybody. See you soon.